Good morning and welcome to St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church online worship on the second Sunday after Pentecost. Even though we are physically separated, it is always good to worship together. We are delighted that you are with us on this special edition coming to you from the St. Bartholomew's Memorial Garden. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. God be with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson, Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. 
Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out in it who is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The Gospel of the Lord. Our story from Genesis this morning is a turning point in the story of Abraham and Sarah. It occurs because Abraham has the wisdom to offer hospitality to three strangers who turn out to be God's messengers. God has promised Abraham that he will be the father of a multitude of nations, even though he and Sarah are childless and of advanced age. Abraham initially finds it unimaginable and as we hear in our text this week, Sarah finds it laughable. We are people whose salvation comes through the unexpected grace of God. And we follow in the faithful footsteps of those who have been able to imagine that God works in remarkable ways. A turning point is a place where we are offered a new path where we can choose to believe in the otherwise unimaginable, the creation of something new and all that is possible with God. In this moment of racial struggle and awareness in our country, if it is truly to be a turning point, we have to choose that new path. We have to believe that something else is possible and want to become a new creation. It certainly feels like this is a cultural moment of awakening and wanting to respond, so I guess it could happen this time. Forgive me, I want to feel hopeful, but mostly I just feel exhausted by it all. Remember that those of us who are black or brown have been standing in this place our whole lives waiting for the path to turn toward possibilities and hope. Even those of us in the middle place of being biracial, certainly we are sometimes afforded majority status when there's not much at stake. Until there's another wave of white fear for whatever reason, war in the Middle East, war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, fear of Muslims, fear of Mexicans, you know, drugs and gang violence, fear of being numerically overwhelmed by the other, 
fear of blacks, again with the drugs and gang violence, fear of Asians, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, World War II, how far back do we want to go? Fear of being overrun in the halls of academia, better limit the Asians. From the perspective of the white majority, we all look alike. We all look not white, either because of skin color or particular features or hair texture and color. Add your racial marker here. Age old fears and prejudices are triggered against indigenous people, against blacks, honestly, against anyone who isn't of British origin or can't blend into those who are. I was four years old the first Christmas I asked for a blonde wig and blue contacts. We'd recently moved onto an army post and away from the multicultural community at Harvard's International House, where we'd had to live because no one in Boston would rent to a biracial family. It hadn't taken long for me to figure out that my life would be so much better if only I were blonde and blue eyed. My parents told me it wasn't me, it was everyone else. Those people were just wrong. They told me about the brown eyes, blue eyes exercise that had been all over the news the year before. I don't think it taught me what they hoped it would. I just learned that people really do care and notice and treat you differently. Everywhere, not just where I lived. Cynical for a four-year-old, but true and reinforced everywhere I went. The brown eyes, blue eyes exercise was a response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The following day, Jane Elliott, a third grade teacher in Riceville, Iowa, asked her students, all of whom were white, how do you think it would feel to be a Negro, Negro boy or girl? It would be hard to know, wouldn't it? unless we actually experience discrimination ourselves. Would you like to find out? The children answered eagerly, yes. Elliot separated the blue-eyed children from the children with brown and green eyes. Then she told them that brown-eyed students were smarter. Intelligence, she told the children, was determined by melanin. She wrote the word on the bulletin board, the more melanin, the darker the person's eyes and the smarter the person. One child noted that Elliot was a bluey herself, yet she was a teacher. Another quickly piped up to explain that if she'd had brown eyes, she'd probably be the principal or superintendent. Elliot sent the brown eyed children to lunch first and gave them a longer recess. The brown eyed children could drink from the water fountain but the blue-eyed children had to use paper cups. Elliot said the change was instant. The children with brown eyes were suddenly more confident and condescending. They hurled nasty insults at the blue-eyed kids. The children with blue eyes made silly mistakes and became timid and despondent. The two groups stopped playing together. Fights broke out. I watched them exhibit all the behaviors the significant adults in their lives modeled for them, Elliot said. I didn't like what I saw. After the exercise, Elliot asked her students to write about what they had learned, and their essays ran in the Riceville Recorder under the headline, How Discrimination Feels. The Associated Press did a follow-up story. Johnny Carson invited her to be on his show. When Elliot returned to Riceville from her appearance on The Tonight Show, she found her town divided. Most of the other teachers wouldn't speak to her. Her own children were bullied at school, her oldest son beaten up. She got mail from people who said the exercise taught white children self-contempt and abused their trust. She received death threats. It was one day, Elliot said, we are worried about white children who experience a couple of hours of made up racism for one day. When children of color experience real racism 
every day of their lives. Why is no one outraged about that? While many people recall the exercise, few remembered the follow-up. On the following Monday, Elliot reversed the exercise, telling the children that there'd been a mistake. It was blue-eyed students who were smarter. She sent them to lunch first and let them stay at recess longer, the same as before. But this time, something was different. Elliot noticed that blue-eyed kids were not as condescending, not as mean as the brown-eyed kids had been. She asked them why. They said, I found out what it felt like to be on the bottom, and I didn't want to make anyone feel like that ever again. They learned. Which means, I guess there's hope. We can learn to be less prejudiced. We can learn empathy. We begin by becoming aware and choosing to become the new creation God is offering us, a new community that includes all of God's children. Our story from Genesis is often illustrated with this icon of the Trinity, written by Rublev. It's an extraordinary depiction of the three messengers at the table as members of the Trinity, with an open spot facing us, the viewer, welcoming us to the table, all of us. Think about our icons and images of the holy and how we see something of ourselves reflected in those images or how we don't. Yesterday, I read a reflection by Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs. She helped me understand some of my soul deep exhaustion this week. And she also gave me hope that images of God might matter might be one avenue forward for us. Bishop Jennifer spoke of her experience as a child growing up in a multicultural neighborhood until she was 10 when they moved to a primarily white community and she never got over it. She writes, I'm tired because I've spent my life pushing away and unlearning the messages that whites and blacks can't be family and friends but too many white folks won't do the work of unlearning those same messages. I'm tired of the burden white supremacy places on me and the black and brown people I love. I'm tired of black folk bearing the symptoms of white sickness. This exhaustion is not two weeks old or global pandemic old. Black and brown people spend our lives learning to live with the exhaustion of white supremacy as a survival mechanism. She describes her family's stories of having been pulled over by police for being black and driving too nice a car, having her plates run because she lives in a nice neighborhood. I recognize some of what she's sharing. My dad's been pulled over for being brown while driving his Mercedes. I've experienced racial profiling for years. For example, over the last three years, I've been randomly selected for a more extensive search of my carry-on luggage every single time I've flown because of my suspicious maiden name, Rana Dive. As Bishop Jennifer writes, here's the thing, every black and brown person in this country, in our congregations, has stories like these. The black and brown folks with Ivy League degrees who show up to our churches in nice dresses and suits have these stories as surely as the black and brown folks we cross the street to avoid. We have these stories and we have not often told them outside of black and brown circles. There are experts who can better explain why, but I suspect that it has something to do with the fact that it is hard to tell the stories of racial trauma to the people who have the power to make things different and won't. And when we have told the stories, we were too often told to get over it, stop playing the race card and conform. The videos we now see played over and over again of the killings and abuses for just living while black have finally awakened those with the power to change things and I hope and pray politics and behavior begin to change. Hope and challenge 
are two sides of the same coin. She went on to challenge the Episcopal Church. We need to stop being afraid of committing to the work of dismantling systemic racism and white supremacy. We need to learn and understand how it operates inside the Episcopal Church and in the world. As a predominantly white institution that is rooted in the American experiment, we must be unequivocal and clear. Our being afraid of making white people upset makes us complicit in keeping white supremacy in place. We must not be afraid of giving our time and financial resources to the groups who are doing this work on the ground. Now is the time for acting, for doing the work of unlearning bias against black and brown people. Our everyday choices from where we buy groceries to what we read to how we adorn our sanctuaries to where our money goes to how we vote all add up. It adds up to a world where people and systems are activated to value and support all of God's children, no matter what they look like or where they come from. And every choice moves us a little closer to God's dream, not just the American dream, God's dream. So let's get to work, church. The time is now. Friends, we can begin right now. Let's expand our images of the holy to include the colors and characteristics of all of God's children. May God help us to grow in love, awareness, and empathy, to make choices which value and sustain the people of God, all of us. Let's move a little closer to God's dream together. Amen. As we join in the singing of our hymn, enjoy the images of icons from the dancing saints of St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church, as well as the artwork of Janet McKenzie and the photography of Brian Summers and the We Love You Project.
affirmation of faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth? I believe and trust in God Almighty. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed the world? I believe and trust in Christ our Savior. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayers of the People let us pray for the church and for the world. God of love, we pray for your church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Thomas, our bishop, Nina, our rector, and for all who seek you in the community of the faithful. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the congregations of St. Andrews in Millinocket and St. Thomas in Wynne, and for the mission and ministry of Camp Bishopswood. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar. God of love, hear our prayers for the Church. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and for all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed, for elected and appointed leaders that they would serve for the common good. Inspire all people with courage to speak out against hatred, to actively resist evil. Unite the human family in bonds of love, God of freedom, hear our prayers for the world. God of justice, we pray for the earth, for the animals and birds, the mountains and oceans, and all of your creation entrusted to our care. May we protect the earth and all its resources and leave to our children's children the legacy of beauty and abundance that you have given us. God of justice, hear our prayers for the earth. God of peace, we pray for our community. Kindle in every heart a desire for equality, respect, and opportunity for all. Give us courage to strive for justice and peace among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace, Hear our prayers for this community. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need or trouble, for those whose lives are cl closely linked with ours and all of the human family, for refugees and prisoners, for those who are sick or suffering, lonely or despairing for all held down by prejudice or injustice. Awaken in us compassion and humility of spirit as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. We pray for Steph, Bobby, Charles, Kellen, Pat, Mackenzie, Mima, Janice, Scott, Katie, Nick, Marcella, Libby, Mike, David, Carrie, Gloria, Noreen, Tim, Eric, Sue, Sam, Kathy, Diane, Alan, Brittany, Arthur, and Matthew. God of mercy, hear our prayers for all who are in need. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, for the faithful in every generation, all who have worked for justice and called us to racial reconciliation. Make us faithful to your call to proclaim your good news by word and example, 
and bring us at last into the glorious company of the saints in light. We pray for Sandra Scully, God of grace, hear our prayers for those who have died. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Confession. God is love and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, O God of our salvation. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Jesus said to the disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. The peace of Christ be always with you. Let us greet one another with the sign of peace by wishing peace to anyone in our household, by texting our friends, perhaps the people we sit near in church, family far and wide. And while we continue sharing the peace, our Vestry Person of the Week will highlight some of our announcements. Good morning, everyone. I'm Susie Pichotto. I'm your Vestry Person of the Week. I'm going to start this morning by reading you some announcements, communication, and connection. Please check our St. Bart's website. You're probably all familiar with this, www.stbartsyarmouth.org for prayers, information, resources, and links. And check your email for news and notes from, ne from Nina. The folks at Friendship House are in need of hygiene items, particularly razors, shaving cream, body wash, and toothpaste. There'll be a plastic box labeled Friendship House under the wooden bench that sits below the overhang at the front of the church. Also, please know that financial contributions are welcomed and can be mailed to Friendship House 390 Lincoln Street, South Portland, 04106. Clink bags are available. We still need to be recycling our bottle deposits correctly. Clink bags are available to help St. Bart's. We've placed a clear plastic container with clink bags under the wooden bench that sits below the overhang at the front of St. Bart's. Thanks so much for your continued support with this. We're still doing mask sewing. This is just as important as ever. We are looking forward for more people to help out. There's some very simple fabric patterns, very simple patterns and fabric to give to you. You can pick up and drop off at 3 Church Street, Yarmouth. If you don't wanna go out, Lee Kirshner from Yarmouth's Aging in Place and Coronavirus Task Force member will pick up and deliver for you. Her email is Lee mk2050 at gmail.com. For more information, please call Mary Calvin at 713-385-4708. Zoom knitting gathers every Monday, all handicrafts really. We hope you'll join us for our Monday handicrafts gathering on Zoom. The Yarmouth Food Pantry is just as important as ever. So some items they're looking for include pasta sauce, baked beans, but no vegetarian baked beans, 
jelly, cereal, canned vegetables and fruit, rice, canned beans, tuna, laundry detergent, shampoo, dish soap, particularly in 20 ounce sizes, coffee, ground coffee please, and that's going to be decanted into smaller portions if you have a larger container of ground coffee. And please leave those donations at the rear of the First Church, First Parish Church in the basket by the food pantry door. Thanks very much. Here's an update from St. Elizabeth's Essentials Pantry. The pantry reopened with a limited outdoor distribution. However, they are not accepting any donations of kitchenware and bedding yet. St. Bart's will provide volunteers on Tuesday, June 23rd from 8.30 to 11. All volunteers are asked to wear a mask and gloves. Volunteers can choose to help outside St. Luke's, excuse me, inside St. Luke's, enter from Park Street, sorting products with social distancing, or outside a safe distance, handling bags of items to our neighbors in need. We continue to need certain items which can be donated through our Amazon wish list. If you would like more information on that, please contact Ann Jacobs or Pam Hobson. Gardening at, and weeding at St. Bart's continues. The front garden is in need of attention throughout the summer. Weeding assistance anytime you do it is greatly appreciated. There is a garden cart in the large shed for transporting any trimmings and weeds. Weeds can be put in a brush pile or leaf, the brush or leaf pile behind the shed or out of sight on the far side of the gully at the edge of the lawn. The gardens continue to be a lovely quiet place to enjoy a bit of outside time and remember our friends and family members. There is a weekly lawn care schedule. Start, please refer to your bulletin for that. We also want to know, you to know that Lecter, Chalice Bear, and VPOW duties will resume. And we will ask you to make a recording of yourself as I'm doing now, um, if you are on the list and we will be in touch with you. Also wanna share a few useful pan resources during the pandemic. First of all, healing prayers please contact Pam Hobson and she or Barbara Barheit will schedule a convenient time with one of the, com the committee members. There is a forward day-by-day -day daily meditation. You go to the bulletin and you click daily prayer. You can access that. The forward day-by-day -day, May, June, and July edition is now available. This is a booklet of daily inspirational inspirational meditations reflecting on a specific Bible passage. I mentioned Lee Karshner before. I'm going to mention her again because of the work that Lee does with Aging in Place. She, uh, she, sincerely, she and her group sincerely hope everybody's well during this incredibly challenging time. They are there to offer assistance with things like grocery shopping, um, picking up medications, uh, emotional first aid, anything that you might need. There is a Yarmouth helpline available Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm gonna give you that number. You'll also have it to access online through the St. Bart's Bulletin, 846-4763. Um, the Epidemiologist series has been postponed at present. And one last resource, the new statewide Maine frontline warm line has two ways to contact for support for healthcare providers, first responders, and their families. The phone number is 207-221-8196. You can also text them to be connected to a volunteer talk to talk with you. And you would text Frontline to 898-211. Thank you very much. Please don't hesitate to look in the St. Bart's newsletters or online for any additional information. Thank you. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Holy One. 
All thanks and praise are yours, our true and loving God. You are the strength and goodness of fatherhood. You are the wisdom and love of motherhood. You are light and grace and blessed love. You are Trinity. You are unity. With so much of this life beyond our control, often overwhelmed by anxiety and grief, we gather around your table to remember that there is nothing the powers of this world can bring, nothing in our present lives, nor in whatever the future may hold. There is nothing in all creation that can separate us from your love. You, O oh God, are nearer to us than our own soul, for you are the ground in whom our soul stands. So will we bless you as long as we live and lift up our voices in praise as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Gracious one, before you made us, you loved us. And when our sin turns us away from you and causes us pain, in your love and mercy, you assure us that all shall be well. All shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. Out of love for us, you sent your son Jesus to live and die as one of us, to teach and heal, to feed those who were hungry, to embrace the outcasts. Through his life, you showed us the depth of your reconciling love for the world. Through his death and resurrection, you overcame death forever and gave to us everlasting life. On their last night together, Jesus gathered with his friends around the table. He took the bread, gave you thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the cup of God's new covenant, with you and with all, the promise of life everlasting. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. The love of Christ restores and transforms us, and we rejoice in our salvation. We open our hearts to love one another as he loved us. We remember how he died and rose again to live now in us. Together with him, we offer you these gifts and ourselves, our souls and bodies. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Empowered by your Spirit, may we do justice and love kindness and walk with you all our days until at the last we are gathered home and our hearts may rest in you. With all your people, past, present, and yet to come, we give you thanks and praise through the Son and in the Spirit in every moment of our lives, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed by your, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. A spiritual communion is a personal devotional that anyone can pray at any time to express their desire to receive Holy Communion at that moment, but in which circumstances impede them from actually receiving. Together, let us pray. Jesus, we believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. We love you above all things and long for you in our souls. While we cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into our hearts. We embrace you and unite ourselves entirely to you. Never permit us to be separated from you. Amen. My friends, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love and make haste to be kind and rest assured that God is infinitely more concerned with the promise of our future than the mistakes of our past. And the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.